Good evening, everyone, and thank you for joining us. My name is Barbara Hogue, and I'm the chapter coordinator for the ICAA in Philadelphia. We're so happy that you could join us for tonight's program. Um, I would love to make a plea to have any of you who are not already a member of ICAA to join us because it allows us to do this wonderful programming for you. If you want to head over to our website after the talk, you can go to classicist-phila.org and join as a member and you'll get lots and lots of more programs just like this. And tonight, um, I am glad to introduce Daniela Voith, who will introduce our speakers this evening. Daniela? Absolutely. Thank you so much, Barbara. And thank you all for um, uh, logging on for what I think is going to be an amazing talk um, with um, Jacob Albert and John Tipman. I am the chapter president of um, the AIA Philadelphia. And um, we're going to have, uh, as I said, a great program. For the last two years, we have presented virtual talks such as this to the public featuring nationally renowned artisans, architects, and designers. Our sponsors, we really have to thank for this because they help us achieve the success. Without their support, none of this would be possible at all. So we graciously thank our sponsors and the following jewel level sponsors, Capoletti Builders, North American Window and Door, Peter Zimmerman Architects, Pinemar, Tradewood, <laughs> Tradewood Windows and Doors, Archer and Buchanan Architecture, Duration Molding and Millwork, Ernst Brothers Builders, John Milner Architects, Lepage Millwork, Rittenhouse Builders, and Spire Builders. So thank you. Um, just a little bit about Jacob and John. Um, they both have devoted their professional lives to celebrating and reinterpreting the rich traditions of New England architecture. They have always been interested in the varied languages of architecture and how they communicate. Their buildings have a strong sense, sense of place and is really very much enriched by their study of history and the history of architecture. They are both founding partners of ART. They studied at Yale, where each received, I mean, I didn't know this, both an undergraduate and the, the graduate degree from, um, from Yale. Um, Jacob is a past board member of the National Society of Architectural Historians and served for 10 years as secretary of the SAH New England chapter. I don't know as much about you, John, so I can't say as much. So I'm gonna stop there and just to say, I have known Jacob since the two of us were at Yale together. Um, I won't say exactly how long ago, um, but I have always, always respected Jacob and um, not only for his design abilities, and I'm sure that this is true of John as well, but Jacob, just watch out for Jacob because he has an amazing sense of humor. Uh, so with that, I will turn it over to the two of you, and I'm um, so glad that you could join us tonight. Well, thank you, Daniela, for inviting us and for that nice introduction. And I think at some point I am going to say what year we were at Yale, so the secret will be out. Um, I'm going to start this dual talk by focusing on one particular aspect of how we design, that is how our buildings learn from other architecture. This process often involves mixing disparate sources and memories and bringing them into a new synthesis. John will then approach synthesizing from another angle. John and I were both initiated into the joys of mixing at an impressionable age at Yale where we both went to college and architecture school, where whole city blocks teem with wondrous architecture of James Gamble Rogers, built from 1917 to 1935. On the left is the York Street facade of Davenport College, which was John's college, which matches the Gothic style of Rogers' earlier Branford and Saybrook colleges across the street. 
when you pass through the Davenport gate, and if I point to it, I don't know if you can see my cursor. Anyway, Davenport gate, you're instantly transported from the atmosphere of old Oxford and Cambridge to colonial America. So the view on the right is what you see when you go through the gate into the courtyard. Around the side of Davenport is a walkway to my college, Pearson, where the Gothic facade of Davenport dissolves into the Georgian of Pearson. Stone goes to brick, leaded casement windows to wood double hung windows. What we're seeing here is maybe not synthesis so much as an expert stitching together. In another type of mixing, the centerpiece of this side of Davenport courtyard contains a quotation of the old state house of 1713 in Boston, which you see on the left. And on the right, you can see what a skillful adapter Rogers was to weave this into the composition. Pearson Tower is loosely a quotation of Independence Hall, which you see on the right. Wrexham Tower in one corner of Branford College on the left is a quotation of St. Giles Church in Wrexham, Wales, where Elihu Yale happens to be buried. That's on the right. The tower in Branford is slightly differentiated from the rest of the courtyard by a different kind of stonework. Um, there is limestone trim um, and some granite, whereas the rest of the courtyard is all seam-faced granite of a slightly different color. So it is um, certainly part of the whole, but slightly distinct from it. Why did Yale build Gothic and Georgian buildings at the same time, in some cases on the same building? One reason was to avoid monotony with so many buildings being built at once and to create an instant sense of history as it might have unfolded over time. The Georgian buildings referred back to Yale's origins embodied in Connecticut Hall of 1750 on the old campus in the left slide. Yale also had a collection of 19th century Gothic revival buildings, such as Dwight Chapel by Henry Austin on the right. But they were more likely harking back to the original English medieval sources like King's College, Cambridge from the 15th century on the left thereby connecting Yale to the origins of the university in Europe. One of my favorite architectural drawings, Robert Venturi's eclectic house, houses collection appeared in 1977, the year I graduated from college and started architecture school. It poked fun at the modernist idea that the outside of the building was the inevitable result of what was happening inside. The outside and inside have their own independent lives and there's a world of choices. Here's what I did when I got to design my own house in Cambridge in the early nineties. I bought the burned out hulk of the right side of a double house which you see on the left in the sketch, which has on the left side, the part of the house that didn't burn and remained, and on the right side, a design for my new house. Though I didn't make any specific gesture to the attached house which remained, I did respond to the general streetscape, most of which consisted of buildings right up to the sidewalk, with a flat cornice line. And these buildings that line up are like that and my house is right here on the next block. But when you look from the side, you can see the facade as a false front, concealing a shed roof behind. The house builds up from back to front. 
The false front allows even a tiny building to stand proudly. I collected images of false fronts from Baroque neoclassical or vernacular. Here on the left, this false fronted building also has diamond shaped shingles on the walls. But what I was really looking at was right in my neighborhood, diamond shaped asphalt shingles in two colors. There were a good many houses around me where this had been done. Now they've mostly been gussied up and my house is one of about two left that still has its checkerboard asphalt shingles. The overall pattern of the diamond shingles on the upper story is also a distant reference to the Doge's palace in Venice and the diamond pattern on its upper part, which Venturi noted in complexity and contradiction has no relationship to other architectural elements like windows. The two are independent. And like the Doge's palace, checkerboard house, which is the name we made up um, for this house, um, seems to dance on its legs. One of my favorite buildings is Samuel McIntyre's Derby Summer House built in 1793 in Salem, which you see on the right. It's a jaunty vertical pavilion with delicate classical details, including swags. The swags say elegance. The asphalt shingles are humble. They kind of balance each other. Checkerboard house is also akin to this vernacular vertical facade with two windows below, door in the middle, big window above, and fluted pilasters that are kind of like my fluted square columns. You often find something strange, compelling, and memorable in vernacular architecture. Checkerboard house has an inset front porch like the one on the right, another haunting vernacular facade. In my case, the inset porch was necessary to get you up to the front door without spilling onto the sidewalk. So you go up from the side into the front door, the front wall angles to allow enough room for the stairs inside. The plan of checkerboard house has these shifts of angles which respond to functional needs and were inspired by Gunnar Asplund in the Villa Snellman at 1917 to 18 outside Stockholm. Asplund's plan has two regular rectangles that are in an angle to each other. And within the rectangle, walls have subtle shifts of angle that give it a dynamism. So the front wall of checkerboard house is at an angle for the reasons I've described behind a screen of columns that's parallel to the sidewalk. And when you enter the living room and dining room, this wall of closets angles back to open up the space as you enter. Villa Snellman also has swags. And clearly they were important to the design because here they are in this very early sketch that Asplen did. And they're still in the building as built, though they've moved. I'll quickly flip through 12 of our houses that show a range of flavors and combinations. I won't say much about them, but then I'll, I'll end with one in more detail. So these houses range from the shingle style, which itself was a new synthesis of American colonial houses, French farmhouses, and Japanese design 
to a shingled mix of 19th century French Norman cottage and rustic baronial hall, to quasi shingle style house integrated with existing old farm sheds, to mountain lodge on the coast of Maine, to shingle style gone vertical in a miniature castle, to a crisp updating of a New England farmhouse without shingles, to a three-story addition to an Adirondack log cabin in the form of a tower inspired by fire watchtowers, to a somewhat more polished interpretation of a client's favorite rustic cottage on Chappaquiddick, to a house at Fisher's Island that we'll come back to in a minute, to another house at Fisher's Island as a sort of stick style bungalow, to a rambling house on Martha's Vineyard that incorporates an old boathouse. Let's take a closer look at one of these houses, which we call Harbor View at Fisher's Island, a skinny seven mile long island off the Eastern Connecticut coast, where we've designed something like 35 new houses and renovations and additions to about 150 more since our founding partner, Jim Ryder started out in 1971. We didn't get explicit stylistic instructions from this client, just that they wanted something that would fit in. So it was our job to figure out what that would be. But before we thought about style, we explored several options for plan and massing, like the diagram on the right, which has pavilions around a courtyard facing the water, pretty close to what we ended up with. We also tried a more linear collection of pavilions, one of them two-story, and a step series of connected pavilions, and a curved grouping. The idea of all of these schemes was to give a family with three grown children places to go separately and places to gather. The final design is a five part plan with a central two story block. The two story block here in, is a big open living, dining, and kitchen. Above are two bedrooms and two bathrooms. In the hyphens are a den on one side and a mudroom on the other. And the two side wings are each one story each with two bedrooms and two bathrooms. This five-part organization goes back to Palladio, as in the Villa Barbaro with its central pavilion, the hyphens and the side pavilions or wings, or an early American Palladian example like the Hammond Harwood House in Annapolis. But mainly what we were trying to do was to distill some of the essence of the East End of Fisher's Island. The East End, which had been mostly farmland for a couple of hundred years, was subdivided according to a plan by the Olmsted brothers. And a number of houses were built there between 1926 and 1930. Not far from our site is Clay Point on the left which has a hierarchy of pavilions with the center one, the biggest and fanciest, then two lower hyphens, which are a little simpler, and finally tapering down to lower perpendicular side wings. Clay Point, which we've just seen, and Gray Gulls, which you see now on the left, also nearby, were designed by the Boston firm Parsons and Waite. Both of these houses are picturesque variations on the colonial revival, both with a mixture of gambrel and gable roofs. 
from gray gulls, we followed the examples of restraint and simplicity, as you see on the right, with very little painted exterior trim. The general character of the original East End houses is informal by 1920 standards and not showy. We also borrowed from ourselves. The side wings of Harbor View are one story and didn't need a gambrel roof. So we transplanted the flared hip roofs or hip roof of the house Jim Ryder designed for himself and Sandy at Fisher's Island in the mid 80s. At Harbor View, we connected all the roofs with a strong continuous eave that wraps all the way around. The entry hall is paneled like that of our client's grandparents' house. But unlike the, house, the houses of the 20s, rooms open onto each other and to outdoor spaces more expansively. The interiors of Harbor View are lighter and more modern than the 20s houses, like the left picture, and are more attuned to the way people live today. We're interested in evolution, using what we and our clients like from the past while making something new. And with that, I will turn you over to John. Jacob, it's always wonderful to hear you talk about architecture. Really is wonderful. Um, okay, so I'm gonna share my screen now. See if I can get this to work properly. Is that working? And can you hear me? Mm -hmm. Good, okay. So, um, Let's see. Um, is this green square showing up, or is it just on my screen? There it goes. Never mind. All right. So um, I've long been interested in how children draw houses. And this is my drawing of a child's drawing of a house. Um, but uh, the way children are, children tell the truth. and they see buildings as creatures. And that's kind of what I'm hoping that you'll see here. Um, it's alive. Um, I came across this photograph this summer when I was doing some research on architecture of North Haven, Maine, an island off the coast. And you can see here a group of people uh, sort of socializing on the front porch. Um, the two building faces sort of create a kind of social gathering space, um, making it possible and to sit around and enjoy each other's company. The building on the left, um, this barn here, to me, I can't help but seeing a face. And what I see is the pursed lips of somebody telling a joke, participating in the group of people over here. So this is just before the punchline comes. And I find this just incredibly charming and alive. We understand three dimensions uh, from our bodies first. We have fronts and backs, we're right and left, we're aware of this up and down. So before we do any kind of um, adult learning about the world, we already know how to live in a three-dimensional world. The faces of buildings imply a back. Uh, a face implies a relative to the building's point of view, a right side and a left side and a top and a bottom. So we use body geometry or body coordinates to describe buildings. So when we talk about buildings, we inevitably slide into our own bodies. Uh, and you just think about when we talk to carpenters, other architects, it's full of words which have to do with our bodies. Um, I won't read these aloud, but you get the point. Um, 
So today I'm going to kind of talk about how our bodies help us synthesize our architecture. And this is a big sprawling topic. So I've somewhat artificially, but I think these form these chapters work. I've got three groups of ways of thinking about this. There's buildings are like bodies themselves. And then we have some techniques for form making. And, uh, and then there's some compositional principles which have to do with gravity and symmetry. So bodies, here's a body that is actually making shelter. Now, of course, this is uh, a metaphor for shelter, um, uh, very important in the medieval world. Um, this is a Piero uh, uh, painting showing the Virgin Mary protecting the faithful. Um, the, as architects, we do keep the elements out. We build roofs that keep the snow out, but we more importantly are creating psychic metaphorical protection. So in this house, the simplicity of the roof with the dormer sort of letting the second floor rooms peek out embraces all of the activity in the house in a single cape, maybe not unlike what the Virgin is doing in this Piero drawing. Or in this house, um, um, the interior big room, the uh, design of the ceiling is like a cat's cradle so to create a sort of tensile fabric that is like a tent protecting everything inside. Um, on this house, the gamble roof has a slightly soft bottom at the eave here and it really feels like a drape of a fabric. And though at the time we were, when we were designing this, we weren't thinking about this Piero drawing, the cape of the Virgin is kind of a gamble roof. And it's just, it's, it's, a, it's a wonderful capacious protector. On this gamble roof, the facade is like a face. So it's really a merging of the Virgin's face into the cape to protect the faithful who are the occupants of the house. And treating buildings as creatures uh, is not unique to architecture. Um, and this in honor of speaking to Philadelphia tonight, um, I thought I'd show this high boy with 18th century high boy with his uh, perfectly coiffed wig, his eyes up here, his arms reaching up. Uh, he's got very athletic ankles and his alarming codpiece is dancing there. And I'm not sure you really want this creature in your house, but there he is, beautiful. Or this rather saucy rooster of a coffee pot with tart lips. Uh, he might really run off with the spoon. So again, be careful. Um, so anyway, so that's bodies as uh, architecture as a body. Then there are subtler things and there's some techniques of form making that I want to talk about. It starts with the fact that our bodies are more or less the same size. And I know there's a great diversity in body types and heights. Some people are tall, some people are short and so forth. But generally speaking, we're the same size. We're bigger than mice and smaller than elephants. And this allows us to design accordingly. So this example shows three exactly the same doors, but scaled, this is the point of scale, differently with regard to our body size. So on the right, is a grand room appropriate for a palace or a grand door frame. On the middle is the more normal kind of quote unquote normal, but a middle version. And on the left, if you're trying to create a sense of compression or childlike size or something, you can scale it down to be smaller than our bodies. So scale and proportion can shape and help us guide, guides us in when we're thinking about rooms. So this is a, um, a living room and it has the sort of palatial size up to the ceiling, um, but there's two calibrations of the cornice line in the room. We didn't pick the very high kink in the ceiling, which we could have done, but we wanted, we calibrated the window bays 
to the high line, but then down just above the door heads is a fireplace ingle nook where you can retreat and be embraced because the scale is brought down. Um, another key piece of all of this stuff is um, proportion. Now we've all learned in architecture schools and other places that columns are often talked about in report the width to the height. And some people think that there are correct and incorrect proportions. And we sort of feel that there are an infinite number of proportions because it's about, it's not about what is traditionally been done one way or another with the column, but what is the effect that we're trying to achieve? So we use the proportion um, in the same way that we sort of think about a body. So you can create a sense of solidity by choosing one proportion, like on the left, as if you were on Jupiter dealing with huge gravity, or a different set of proportions would emerge if you were on, a, on Venus with a smaller gravity point. So the lightness and the airiness that come from an, of an attenuated proportion might be what we're trying to achieve on a design. For example, on the right is the thinner, more drawn out proportion, uh, vertical, thinner pieces. And on the left is a square, more sturdy, solid kind of proportion. And these are, yes, there's some architectural history in it, but these are body derived sensibilities. Rhythm. Now, rhythm is a very broad, big topic, very interesting to me. Um, our bodies have taught us about heartbeats. We have, we breathe. Well, when we walk, there's a certain pace. Um, we know that if the breath goes faster, that's activity. If the heartbeat runs up, we must be doing some exercise. If the heartbeat goes down, maybe we're relaxed. Walking and running have different paces. And of course, in music, sort of the one, you know, there's always the tempo and andante, which is kind of runs at about 75 beats a minute, is walking pace, which is very similar to how many steps you'd take in a minute and very similar to your heartbeat uh, striking, you know, 72, uh, 72 beats a minute is sort of a, a normal uh, uh, heart rate. So, are, we have this innate body understanding for what rhythm is um, and breath. And this is a room that we designed um, in the basement of the Harvard Lampoon, which we're now restoring all the exterior uh, roof. But this room was never built originally by Wheelwright, the original architect in 1909. But when we put these, we, we kitted out this basement room as a, as a room room for the lampoon, we built these arches, which are like ribs and expanding. And so there's a, not only is there the rhythm of the repeating ribs, but there's also the expansion in this basement room to sort of give some sense of air, even though the ceiling is very low. In this house, as an example, we often use arcades to help describe and shape the circulation path. So in this house, we had a very long, because of the way the site was, we needed a long path to get from the courtyard where you arrived into the house, the main living parts of the house. So the arcade creates a kind of measured rhythm to sort of pace you as you move through. Here's another house where we use rhythms. And in this case, we're sort of playing with the syncopated rhythm. So in the corridor on the left, you can see the sort of A, B, B, A, B, B, A, and that creates a kind of a rhythm that's different from the steps or these balusters here, or the on the front of the porch, there's the steady rhythm of the columns, but then some subtle syncopation in the way that the front door is registered differently. So we use these rhythmical things to express the motion in the house or um, uh, and it relates to the way that our we expect rhythm and rhythm feels ordered on this on the left is 
that the rhythm doesn't have to always be consistent. It's a musical game. So four short notes, one loud note, or four corded notes, and then it begins to be more chromatic as it shifts, shifts the angle and expands outward. So that's some of the techniques. Now, compositional principles. Um, gravity is, of course, a hugely important one. Uh, we're never surprised when the teacup that we're holding in our hand crashes to the floor if, we, if it slips. It, gravity is always how we experience things. When we're tired and we sit down, we feel comfortable. If somebody is energetic and they jump up to greet you, you feel the same joy that they see when you feel their body moving. Columns express the classical order of columns. Um, so in this ionic doodle I did, you can feel the pressure of the gravity as the column pushes down and distends the torus and the scotia are squeezed in. You can feel the, the pressure down, but simultaneously, you feel the energy and the sort of life force which is pushing the column up. And as Vincent Scully taught us, the ionic volutes are, can be created with a paddle in water and you create the eddies and it's, it's the thrust and the movement, the power to lift up the weight. And that gives a sense of vigor and, and, and life force. Uh, in this chimney that we did, uh, the chimney mass crushes down like, can I say it, a ton of bricks over the fra and fracturing the stone uh, uh, base uh, as, it, as it crackles down. So there the sense of weight uh, within the sort of uh, woody ceiling is, is, is this wonderful sort of contradiction, at least wonderful in our mind. Or in this case, gravity is denied the stairs we have no expressed how do they stand up? And this is a fairly tall staircase. And so a light staircase sort of assists psychologically anyway, the movement up. You, if you're climbing upstairs, there's no work at all. It's, there's no gravity here. You just float up. In this house, there's this sense of the, the wall and there's this movement and the arch at the end was intended to feel like the spring point before the house wants to sort of launch itself into the into the Atlantic. Um, an arch like that column both expresses the compaction of the weight, but also the sort of active life force to lift up. And um, inside that room, you've got this wonderful sweep, uh, which feels which, you know, creates this airiness and openness. Um, and you feel the energy. Um, I can't help but show Jacob's wonderful house to talk about a little point that I always wanted to add, which is, is that is the sense of gravity. This is a vertical composition. And as Jacob pointed out, the two sheds sort of rise up, the, the lifted up on its legs gives the sense of energy and life force. So yes, it's dancing on its legs, as Jacob said, but you, you, we, our mirror neurons respond to the life force and we get a kind of jolt of alertness by looking at this building. Okay, symmetry. And this is the last compositional principle I'm gonna tangle with right now. One thing that's really interesting to me is that all animals are symmetrical. There are no asymmetrical animals. There are some worms that are radially organized. And someone pointed out that flounders uh, are asymmetrical because they have two eyes on one side. But it turns out that they're born with the eyes on both sides. And then the eye migrates around as they become adults. But anyway, with some odd eccentricities in the animal world, the fundamental condition of form is symmetry. And our, we understand that in our bodies. We understand that in faces. Um, so here are two symmetrical beings, these two uh, athletes from um, ancient Greece. The figure on the left is static and standing in a symmetrical composition. The figure on the right 
the Discobolus. This is a Roman copy of it, but we know it to be um, uh, a Greek sculpture um, originally, has the dynamic movement. And there's this incredible, you know, you're waiting for that disc to just go flying. There's this coiled power that's expressed in the, in the composition. So we, we know it's symmetrical, but the composition creates movement and dynamism. And so here on this facade, which you can feel that the building should have been symmetrical, but it's dynamic, it's, it's shifted its weight to respond to the rolling terrain and um, the sense of symmetry is still there, but the asymmetry creates a sense of movement and energy. In this house, though the parts are more or less symmetrical with the exception of the little garage, um, but the casual asymmetrical composition creates a sort of a relaxed sense of how this house was to be organized. So we were not trying to be a Villa Barbaro kind of thing on this house. We were looking for a more casual thing. And so the asymmetry allowed that um, dynamism to be expressed. Um, this house, there's two symmetrical parts, but they're composed asymmetrically. Obviously, the one on the right is the, is the entrance to the house. Um, but it creates, again, this sort of casual, not so formal way of being. Um, in distinction the, to that point, the Redwood Library, which is a formal grand building in Newport, was a touchstone for this house that we did. Um, um, the Redwood Library, of course, is a formal building. Sym symmetry is what you would expect in a public building. There's a kind of expectation of that. Um, and it creates a sense of solidity and, 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 and certainty. But a house, though it might touch on that, the door really had to be on the left. It had to shift off because there needed room. We couldn't split the one small room with a, with a door. So houses, one of the things I like to think about is the houses dream of symmetry, but life gets in the way. And that's really okay. Um, so to sum it up, here's a house that's on the south southeast coast of Massachusetts, and I'd just like to just say a couple things. That one, the houses can be like bodies. So I see this house as two bodies. Um, um, it's it's um, um, shelters has a big roof. The scale and the size of the, the elevation where we pulled this eave down is just above our head. So it creates a sort of an intimate um, approach. We intended that. The entrance is a sideways movement, not a frontal movement. Um, the proportion is vertical and the intention was to make it feel lighter uh, not not a, not a more horizontal proportion on the gable ends. Um, there's a sense of rhythm, you know, the colonnade which ties together the hard garage doors we always have to deal with, and then this arcade becomes the entry piece. The rhythm changes on the brackets of the kitchen, and like a train chugging forward with its cattle. Uh, whatever it's called, the thing on the front of a train, there's a sense of sort of movement that is abetted and expressed by the rhythm of the, of the parts. Um, and then, you know, the symmetry being broken as the south side windows lift up, but then they have a big eave to protect them from the south sun, uh, the sense of gravity, are these windows lifting up or is the gravity pulling it down, I think it's both. Um, um, so we do all of this to communicate in a sort of universal language, not trying to rely on a sort of academic um, um, uh, interpretation or, so for us, the synthesis is based in the body, at least in this talk it is, and that's, all I have.
Well, I mean, both of you, that's absolutely amazing. Um, really great way to talk about uh, such a beautiful and impressive, um, I'll use the word body of work um, and such a delight to, to look at as well. Um, I think we have time for some questions and um, Barbara, are you gonna field those? I am. So if anyone has any questions um, for either John or Jacob, um, you can feel free to ask the questions in the chat function or the q a if have a moment and we'd love to hear from you well while people are warming up i just wanted to say is that um what i particularly appreciate is both your erudition in terms of of um <laughs> um you know, traditional detailing and your total willingness to break all the rules. <laughs> and, um, you know, particularly something I noticed a number of times is, you know, putting the windows just slid right up into the entablature. I mean, such a no-no thing to do, but so beautiful at the same time. So um, can you talk more about um, what's obviously uh, an interest of both of yours? You want to start, Jacob? Well, yes, I mean, that we, um, we certainly are interested in um, sometimes testing the limits of the rules and um, not, um, not really to make a point, but just to um, um, have a little fun with it. Yeah. And and a lot of these so-called rules, like the entablature breaking, I mean, uh, Monticello has a window crashing through a through the entablature in the in the front hall. So, and you can find all kinds of examples of that, you know, infraction in in Rome. So, almost any rule that somebody writes down, you can always quickly say, "Yeah, but over here." <laughs> so, but I do, but we do, we don't feel trapped by them or they're, they're, they're part of the way that we like to say things. And yeah. Language is, is more expressive if people understand it. You know, if I, can go, if I suddenly start speaking gibberish, no one understands what we're saying. True that. So we have um, a comment um, from Stephen Harvey who says, Ravi, John, and Jacob, stunning houses and so clearly presented, embodied uh, <laughs> with a compelling body of theory. So thank you. And then another question. I'm wondering if you can speak about the relationship of your clients to the design process. You start, Jacob. Uh, okay. Um, there a big part of it and the bigger part of it they are the better um i know john likes to talk about houses as a portrait of the client and that's um that's true and um if we didn't have clients if we were just designing everything for ourselves we might um not really know what to do the client helps to set the direction and um, it's what makes each house different from the others because we take the client's really specific um, character and interest um, into account. The combination of client and place is what makes each house special. Yeah, and I'll just make a quite a little add to that is, is that we ask, obviously we do, we ask our clients for, you know, what is the program and so forth, but there's another part which is more intuited and um, where we get a sort of a sensibility. The clients can't always speak architecture and that's what we're drawing for them. So they might ask for something like, oh, we'd like this to feel like it belongs or something like that, but without being able to put 
uh, a form to it. And we enjoy the process of exploring the different forms that then when we hit the right thing, the client just lights up and we say, yes, that's then we then we know we've got something. And we have another one more comment, just so you can go away feeling like what a great, what a great presentation uh, uh. Um, from Materze Roche, which I may be mispronouncing. If so, I apologize, but truly enjoyed the seamless flow and relationship between architecture, art, physiology, and psychology. Thank you. And with that, we at the ICAA in Philadelphia say thank you so much uh, uh. for joining us tonight and for your presentation and for all of these wonderful images and houses that we've been able to be exposed to tonight. Thank you. Well, thank you for asking us. We enjoyed, we enjoyed putting it together. So great to see you both. And I hope to be up in Boston sometime soon and do another drop in. So maybe I'll get to meet you in person, John. Looking um, forward to it. Thank you. Lovely, lovely talk. And I'm so thrilled that Stephen Harvey got to got to um, join us as well. So um, thank you. Thank you, everyone. Good night. Yep. Good night. Good night.